You may have seen some of the man-made islands Dubai has built, but today we're talking about a project that didn't go as planned, the World Islands. Now, Dubai is known for its lavish living and some jaw-dropping construction projects, like the Burj Khalifa, the Frame, and the Dubai Aquarium. The city is one of the most popular tourist destinations in the world, with an influx of nearly 16 million visitors every single year. But apart from the modern skyscrapers, luxury supercars, and other island projects like the Palm Jumeirah, have you heard of this huge project in the city that flew under most people's radar? We're talking about none other than the World Islands and what happened with this ambitious project. Now, what are the World Islands? Located off the coast of Dubai, the World Islands are a collection of man-made islands similar to the Palm Jumeirah, but designed to replicate the shape of the world. Each island is named after its corresponding country, and when the project was first announced back in 2003, it was set to be the next big thing in the world of tourism. And I mean, it matches the level of ambition compared to other projects Dubai has built. The idea made headlines, and Dubai saw an influx of developers and investors to the world islands, since each island was up for sale. Now, designing something like the World Islands is outrageous and ambitious on its own, but actually building it is what makes the project so interesting. Millions of tons of sand were transported from the Gulf to the designated spot to put these artificial islands on the map. And you're probably wondering, well, how did the sand not get washed away by the ocean? Well, before developers and engineers could even think of transporting sand, they had to transport and set millions of tons of rocks to keep the sand in place. So they used rocks as a foundation to pour the sand on top of, not to mention what this does to marine life. There are 300 islands ranging in size that were meant to be sold individually for different purposes. After the idea for the islands was conceived, the islands were supposed to be developed by Nikhil Properties, a group that has done some major developments around Dubai. And the development on the 300 islands was supposed to be done by Dutch companies Van Oord and Boscalis. Now, all these developers are the same companies that built the world-famous Palm Jumeirah. So, I guess we can say they've had some experience building man-made islands. Now here's the problem with the world islands. They're sinking. While Nikhil Properties has denied the islands are sinking, marine researchers with special thanks to NASA claim the sand is slowly settling into the sea and the islands are sinking. And this isn't just the world islands we're talking about. Even the Palm Jumeirah is sinking. Now, it's nothing alarming. It's only around 5 millimeters per year. Now, for some clarification here, it's not exactly that the World Islands or the Palm Jumeirah are sinking. It's actually the other way around, and that's the rate that the Persian Gulf is rising. And while Nikhil Properties to this date claims that the World Island Project will be completed, it kinda seems like they threw $15 billion into the ocean. At least, that's how much was reportedly spent prior to the collapse in 2008. The developers also claim they've been monitoring the islands over the past three years, and report there hasn't been anything concerning in terms of sea level and erosion, but this is the kind of thing that might take a little longer to see the full effects. And if we look at how the Palm Jumeirah is only sinking at five millimeters a year, it's not exactly an urgent rate of change now, but it could become threatening in the future. As projects like this start to gain traction and more developers kick off construction, wouldn't it be more concerning if sinking starts maybe 10 to 20 years down the line? All right, now for the million dollar question on everyone's mind. Why are the world islands mostly empty 
and what happened? Well, what started as a revolutionary project set to take over the world, pun intended, slowly became a ghost town, or ghost islands, after the 2008 financial crisis. The meltdown on Wall Street put a damper on things, so I guess luckily I was too young to understand all the stuff that was going on. I was a kid, and I was more worried about my parents' divorce happening at the same time. While we're on the subject, the 2008 crisis shook the world, and if you've been following the news lately, the state of the current market is inducing some flashbacks. Inflation is hovering around a 40-year high. U.S. household debt recently surged at its fastest annual pace since 2008. Real estate experts are forecasting the market's first annual loss since 2012, and experts at banks like Morgan Stanley are predicting more stock market pain in the near future. It's all pretty scary, but luckily we can learn from the past. The last time inflation was this high, only three asset classes gained value over a long-term stretch, one of which was an unlikely investment, fine art. Between 1973 and 1981, on average, contemporary art pieces appreciated at an annual rate of 17.5%, according to the MW All Art Index. And with our sponsor, Masterworks, almost any investor can now join this market for a fraction of the cost. In eight of their last nine exits, Masterworks has delivered net returns of over 13.9% to their investors. It's no wonder almost 600,000 people have signed up. Many offerings have sold out quickly. But for all my subscribers, you can gain priority access with the link in the description. So, Nikhil claims that 60% of the islands were sold to private contractors in 2008, and at least 20 that all sold in the first four months of 2007 during the craze before the collapse. There were a bunch of big names and celebrities buying up land on these islands for various projects, like private mansions, resorts, and event space. The thing is, a lot of people who bought islands back in 2008 have not started development yet for a bunch of reasons. Now, a lot of this island project is undeveloped, but a few of the islands have some stuff going on. The Lebanon Island was the first to open, and in the South American region, they have Antara World Islands, which is a resort with amenities like a floating lounge. So the project has seen some success on at least a couple islands, but there's a lot of speculation going around that Dubai made entry into this mega project extremely difficult for private buyers. I mean, buying in the World Islands isn't the same as buying a house in Dubai. An investment here would probably rake in millions of dollars from the tourism it brings if it's done well, but that's only if it ever gets completed. Spokesperson of the project, Graham Lovett claims the World Islands haven't been abandoned and will be completed. I don't know about anyone else, but I kind of hope that's true because I think this could turn into a super interesting project if completed. The World Islands project might be mostly deserted, but it's still getting attention these days, especially as Saudi Arabia is trying to build the ambitious Neom project. Now, like I said, a decent amount of the islands sold by 2008, so there's still developers out there who own these mini country islands. Dubai's developer Limitless announced it would be developing a $161 million wellness resort on Serbia Island. Pearl Dubai paid nearly $28 million for a nearby island covering 150,000 square meters. And Dubai-based developers have also started development of the Heart of Europe project spanning across the islands of Switzerland, Sweden, Ukraine, Netherlands, 
Germany, and Austria as a resort mimicking European luxury and elegance in this kind of resort destination. And the islands corresponding to Turkey and Shanghai were purchased by two developers back in 2008. Nikhil is claiming it'll put the world back on the map, but the project seems to be in a limbo. The Lebanon island is owned by Abu Dhabi-based businessman Ravi Rahman. And last we heard, in 2018 he was trying to sell the floating property for $22 million, so that doesn't reflect well for the rest of the islands. And this leads us to the next issue with the World Islands. Aside from the insanity that was 2008, a major challenge with this project is the cost of operations. Unlike all the other prime tourism spots, including the other man-made island projects in Dubai, visitors need to take a boat to get to the World Islands because there is no connection to the mainland. These islands aren't even connected to each other, so the only way to get around is by boat. The cost of operating the islands requires an insane amount of diesel for transporting people and bringing resources like food and water to the resorts. And since this project didn't turn out as expected, they don't get a ton of visitors. But hey, if you're interested, you can actually rent out the Lebanon island for corporate events and go on tours of surrounding islands that remain abandoned. That sounds like a pretty lit work party to me. Now, I'm guessing Nikhil caught on to this issue, and that's why they announced a plan to connect the islands with a road. What that's gonna look like, I'm not sure. Now, the plan was first announced back in 2013, but like the rest of the project, there's been no development yet, and the World Islands project still remains an ambitious mystery. It's already been 20 years since the project was announced, so it could be another decade or so until the World Islands are close to finished. The future of this project remains unclear, but it certainly did not turn out as planned. So what do you think? Will Dubai's World Island project ever gain traction? Or is it flawed by design? Or do you think Saudi Arabia's development of Neom has a better chance of succeeding? Let us know in the comments. And hey, if you enjoy this kind of content, subscribe to the channel, sign up for our email list if you want. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.